Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm, I'm Richard Samuels, uh, the director of the Center for International Studies here at MIT, and appreciate your making time to participate in this virtual STAR forum to discuss democratic failure, which is, of course, a provocative and sadly very timely subject. Uh, as many of you will recall, uh, after the demise of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War, we became familiar uh, with the notion of failed states. And at that time, we had the luxury of looking in from the outside. And we looked in triumphantly. And that was a long time ago. Uh, and the Soviet Union was an authoritarian state. And since then, and, and really before the, the Trump presidency, scholars and journalists began to focus on how inequality, elitism, trespassed norms, broken social contracts, racism, failed institutions, and generally the loss of trust can undermine democratic process as well. And now, of course, we've felt those crevices being pried open, uh, pried open further. And suddenly, really, with, with shocking force and disturbing consequences, and we find ourselves wrestling with and uh, fretting, uh, fretting about the, the possibility of, that our upcoming election might not only be adjudicated in the courts, uh, but also on the streets. Now, I, I come to the subject as, as an outsider. Uh, I'm an American political scientist, but I don't study the United States. I'm a Japan specialist uh, who a few years ago began, to, began a project in Japan on uh, the far right. Uh, that was in the mid 2010s. And of course, by then Japan was already a robust democracy, uh, but it was a moment when nationalist voices denying the atrocities in Nanjing, extolling the virtues of Japanese expansion uh, in mid 20th century Asia and, and calling for a reversal of Japanese apologies for its wartime aggression were becoming full throated. Most of the discourse there remained within the bounds of, of democratic politics, certainly within the bounds of free speech, but a number of hate groups uh, felt emboldened to spew deeply ugly vitriol against minorities in public demonstrations in Japan's minority neighborhoods in, in Tokyo and Osaka and, and elsewhere. And all that was made all the more alarming, both for Japanese and for foreigners who knew the history of so-called uh, violence specialists. Uh, that, those were the thugs who had been hired by legitimate political parties uh, and, and who prefigured a moment when Japan's government by assassination would gain traction in the interwar period. And we know how all this came out. Uh, it was a disaster for Japan, for its neighbors, and for many others as well. But fortunately, however, th this time, the Japanese public remained vigilant and wouldn't have any part of extremist uh, nationalism. They defended their democracy. Uh, their government, an elected conservative one, consolidated power and quieted much of the hate speech. Now, this was a very welcome outcome, but it was also a lesson that activism at the fringes of civic responsibility and respectability in a country with a history of political violence and military government demands vigilance. Now, as we all know, uh, the imagined close call in Japan was not all there was to be concerned about. Subsequent news from Dresden, from Budapest, from Ankara, most recently from Hong Kong and elsewhere have been much more unsettling, much more. And so has been the news from Portland and Kenosha and Lansing and Washington, DC, here, all here in a country with its own history of violence and repression. And as we'll hear today, incivility just may be a part in the, of the DNA of every democracy. Uh, my point and, and the organizing idea behind this forum is, is just very straightforward. It, it's the connection of violence to democracy, incivility to democracy is not merely foreign and it's not merely historical, but it's both of those as well. Its elements are universal and they reside within all civic nations, including our own. And it behooves us to understand how, and it behooves us to understand why. So that's the task before our four uh, distinguished panelists, each of whom has thought about these issues in much greater depth than I. They'll begin with a review of how elected leaders routinely have subverted democratic institutions and allowed democracies to slide into authoritarianism and then We'll focus in order on Germany, then on India, 
and then we'll return to the United States. And they'll ask what drives democratic systems apart and what, if anything, still drives them together. How do they survive? Why do they fail? So let me introduce our panelists. Stephen Levitsky is the David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and the Professor of Government at Harvard University. He's the co-author with Daniel Ziblatt of How Democracies Die, which, is a, which was a New York Times bestseller and has been translated into 22 different languages. He's also co-author of Competitive Authoritarianism, Hybrid Regimes After the Cold War. The aforementioned Daniel Ziblatt is Eaton Professor of the Science of Government, also at Harvard, who specializes in the study of Europe and the history of democracy. And in addition to How Democracies Die, he's also the author of Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, full cycle here. Uh, it's a historical account of, of Europe's democratization, which won the American Political Science Association's Woodrow Wilson Prize for the best book in government and international relations and the American Sociological Association's Barrington Moore Prize. Niti Nair is Associate Professor of History at the University of Virginia. She teaches South Asian history with a special emphasis on colonialism, nationalism, decolonization, and the afterlives of the partition of the Indian subcontinent. She's a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and an author of the author of Changing Homelands, Hindu Politics and the Participation of India. And our final uh, speaker of this afternoon is Susan Hennessy. She's the executive editor of Lawfare, the popular and very influential podcast and general counsel of the Lawfare Institute. She's also a Brookings Fellow um, uh, in national security law. And prior to joining Brookings, uh, Susan was an attorney at the Office of General Counsel of the National Security Agency and is co-author with Benjamin Wittes of Unmaking the Presidency, Donald Trump's War on the World's Most Powerful Office. Okay, so the forum will proceed in the order of their introduction and you'll find the Q&A feature on the bottom uh, toolbar. So please type in any questions you have there and please try to remember to identify to whom you are addressing them. Uh, I'll field them after the speakers have each made their remarks. And now I'll get out of your way and hand things over to Professor Levitsky. Steve. Thanks, Dick. And thank you uh, to the forum for, uh, for the invitation. So it's a pleasure to be here. So um, democracies do not die the way they used to die. Uh, democracies used to die at the hands of men with guns. During the Cold War, three out of every four democratic breakdowns took the form of a classic military coup like Pinochet in, in Chile or, or Franco in Spain. Today, democracies die in a much more subtle way. They die at the hands not of generals, but of elected leaders, presidents, prime ministers who use the very institutions of democracy to subvert it. They use elections, plebiscites, acts of Congress or parliament, court rulings. Um, this is Chavez, Erdogan, Orban in Hungary. What we think is so dangerous about this electoral role uh, to autocracy is that it happens behind a pretty credible facade of democracy. There are usually no tanks in the streets. The constitution usually remains more or less intact. Elections are still held. Congress continues to function. And as a result, many citizens aren't fully aware of what's happening often until it is too late. So the question is, how does this happen? And Daniel and I in our book argue that democratic politics requires um, something we don't always think that much about in politics, which is forbearance, a, uh, a shared willingness on the part of the political elite to deploy their institutional authority with restraint, effectively to not use the letter of the law to subvert its spirit. This slide into electoral authoritarianism is almost always accompanied by the use of what is now commonly called constitutional hardball, the very explicit use of the letter of the law to subvert its spirit. Uh, and there's sort of three steps that are, that, are, that are quite common in all of these cases. Almost invariably, first, an elected autocrat starts by capturing the referees. Well, I'm gonna use a sports metaphor because I've been missing sports in general. Um, capturing referees means purging and packing law enforcement, intelligence, tax, judicial uh, agencies, packing the courts in effect, controlling the referees, controlling what, what, what are supposed to be the arbiters of political conflict 
um, allows governments to shield themselves from prosecution uh, and to use the courts and law enforcement agencies as weapons against their rivals to engage in lawfare. Um, a second step, once you control the referees, is to use the control of those referees to begin to sideline the opposing team's players. This means using your uh, tax and regulatory agencies, using law enforcement bodies, uh, intelligence offices to begin to investigate, threaten, sometimes punish independent media, important uh, business people who may finance the opposition and opposition figures. This may, uh, in, the, in the most extreme case, it might mean the, the jailing or exile of, of key independent figures, journalists, editors, newspaper owners, but more often it's a much more subtle process of co-optation and uh, kind of bullying into silence. Uh, and uh, the third step is, is, is institutionalization, is beginning to change the rules in ways that tilt the playing field. This may involve uh, electoral gerrymandering, reconfiguring the electoral rules in ways that grossly favor the incumbent, but also political party rules, campaign finance rules, media access rules, in, uh, um, done brilliantly, for example, in, uh, in both Hungary and Venezuela in ways that, that seriously disadvantage the opposition. So the outcome, the, the result, is what Luke and Wei and I call competitive authoritarianism, a regime that is formally democratic, in which there continues to exist um, uh, electoral competition, but in which the playing field is pretty heavily skewed against the opposition. Now, how, how do you get there? Um, there actually are not that many cases of full-scale democratic deconsolidation in the world. Established, fully democratic regimes that then slide into competitive authoritarianism. Hungary is a clear case. Venezuela is a clear case. Uh, maybe Poland, um, maybe India, hopefully not the United States. Uh, Philippines is arguably another case. Contemporary El Salvador. But there, there are not a ton of cases in the early 21st century. Um, and what has to happen for this to happen is, is party, political parties that had been using restraint, political parties that had uh, largely been engaging in forbearance, somebody's got to stop doing that. Somebody's got to stop playing by, by democratic norms and to engage in, in hardball. So you need both motive and capacity for a party to shift in a, in a more um, hardball or dirty politics direction. Um, there are a bunch of routes I want to just sort of very quickly um, present two, two possible routes to this, to this outcome. One of the most common in Latin America is populism. Populists mobilize uh, poor or marginal voters against the establishment and establishment institutions. They campaign explicitly on a pledge to do away with the old system, to drain the swamp, to bury what they depict as a corrupt and unrepresentative oligarch. Now, sweeping away the old political elite and its institutions is a pretty radical mandate when you think about it, but it is exactly what these guys are elected to do. They're not elected to, to, to change tax policy or trade policy. They're elected to give the, the old elite a punch in the gut. That's what, pop, at, in essence, what populists are elected to do. The problem is that the corrupt and unrepresentative institutions that populists rail against, they promise to sweep away, are things like legislatures, political parties, Supreme Courts. And in fact, when a populist wins the presidency, almost invariably, he or she finds that the old elite that they've been railing against still controls these other institutions. The traditional parties still have a majority in Congress. The, uh, the appointees of the traditional parties sit on the, the Supreme Court and other independent agencies. For a political outsider who has been elected on a pledge to do away with the old system, that creates a real incentive to assault these institutions, to try to bully or close or circumvent Congress, to pack the court, to rewrite the rules of the game. If you are elected on a platform of doing away with the old political elite to then sit down and negotiate policy with that elite, which is what you have to do uh, normally, is, is, is a betrayal of your electoral mandate. And betraying a populist electoral mandate can be politically costly. So populist presidents have a political, it's not just that they're illiberal people, it's that they've got a political incentive to assault democratic institutions. And that's a recipe for crisis. It's a recipe for a conflict between a populist outsider 
who has promised to sweep away the corrupt, unrepresentative elite and a political elite that often views these institutions, Congress, Supreme Court, other independent agencies uh, as a last bastion of defense. Populist presidents sometimes lose these showdowns. I could give you examples where you probably have not heard of them because they lost these showdowns and, and disappeared into the dustbin of history, but they usually win them. They usually win them because when a newly elected populist takes on the old political elite, public opinion usually tends to favor the, the president. This is people like Fukimori in Peru, Chavez in Venezuela, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Korea and Ecuador had 70, 80% approval rates when they took on, when they, when they began their assault on democratic institutions. The opposition's lack of support is often um, reinforced by organizational weakness. Populists generally win, this is not the case in the US, but populists generally win elections when established political parties are in crisis. So as a result, the opposition tends to be quite fragmented and disorganized, which makes it really hard to mobilize against an abusive president. When a populist president takes on a, um, a, a weak, discredited, fragmented elite, the populist usually wins. And when the populist wins, the result is very, very often a skewed playing field. With 70 or 80% support with a fragmented, weak opposition, presidents can concentrate a ton of power. They can close Congress. They can elect a new one with a pro-government majority. They can pack the courts. They can pack the electoral authorities. They can pack other state institutions. They can rewrite electoral laws to weaken political parties. And in some cases, they can rewrite the Constitution in ways that strengthen the incumbent at the expense of, of their opponents. So all of this is a recipe for competitive authoritarianism. Um, so populists with big electoral majorities are one obvious path from democracy into competitive authoritarianism. But another factor may be less common, but I think more relevant to the United States that Daniel and I have been thinking about in, in recent months uh, is not so much big populist victories or big, uh, big majorities, but rather almost the opposite, fear of losing. Um, when, when losing becomes for a political party something of an existential threat. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this and then I will uh, seed the word. Democracy requires that parties know how to lose. That means when we lose an election, we accept defeat, we go home, we get drunk, we regroup, and we get ready to play again the next day. But for parties to lose graciously, two conditions have to hold. First of all, parties have to believe they stand a chance of winning again in the future. And second, parties have to believe that losing will not bring some kind of catastrophic or ruinous consequences. When politicians fear that they're not gonna be able to win future elections, or when they believe that defeat will bring catastrophe, the stakes rise very high. Politicians' time horizon is narrow, and sometimes they throw tomorrow to the wind and in favor of sort of an any means necessary strategy, an effort to win today. In other words, it is often desperation that leads politicians to play dirty. It's fear of losing. Uh, Daniel, who you hear from him in, in a couple of minutes, found this dynamic in his research on 19th century Germany. German conservatives at the end of the 19th century were terrified by the prospect of universal suffrage. For them, giving the working class the right to vote meant not only the right to electoral demise, but the demise potentially of the entire aristocratic order. Um, in the face of that perceived existential threat, conservatives played dirty for decades using fraud and repression to hold on to power all the way into to World War I. Closer to home, think about Southern Democrats after the Civil War. Reconstruction, the 15th Amendment brought widespread black enfranchisement across the US South. African Americans constituted either an outright majority or a near majority in just about every Southern state. So their enfranchisement, mass enfranchisement of African Americans scared the bejesus out of Southern Democrats and their supporters. Not only did black suffrage potentially threaten it, or almost certainly threaten the Democrats electoral dominance, but it threatened to overturn the entire racial order in the South. Facing what they perceived to be an existential threat, Democrats in the U.S. South played dirty. Between 1885 and 1908, all 11 post-Confederate states passed laws or constitutional reforms that allowed the use of poll taxes, uh, literacy, set, literacy tests, property requirements, residency requirements to effectively eliminate African Americans' right to vote. Black turnout in the U.S. South fell from 61% in, 19, uh, in 1880, excuse me, 
to 2%, 2% in 1912. So unwilling to lose, Democrats in the South stripped the right to vote for nearly half the population, ushering in nearly a century of authoritarian rule. Daniel and I fear, I should speak for myself, I fear that something similar is happening to the Republican Party of the US today. Republican medium term electoral prospects are pretty dim. Republicans are an overly, overwhelmingly white Christian party, but white Christians, as everybody knows, are a declining portion of the US electorate. 1992, when Bill Clinton was elected, white Christians were 73% of the electorate. Um, by 12, 2012, Obama's reelection, they were down to 57%. By 2024, they'll likely be below 50%. It's worse than that, though, because younger voters are overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh, in the midterms last year, in midterms 2018, people 18 to 29 voted by more than two to one margin for the Democratic Party. It's 30 something, voting 60% Democrat. But it isn't just that Republicans face a bleak electoral future, it's that the Republican base has come to view defeat as catastrophic. Many Republican voters fear that they're on the brink not just of losing elections but of losing their country. The very idea of a white Christian America seems to be slipping away. Um, so like the old Southern Democrats, Republicans have increasingly an incentive to play dirty. Um, I will stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, giving us a lot to think about and set the table for us. Uh, Daniel? Yes, great. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, also for the invitation, the opportunity to talk. Um, I, I want to begin just by saying that I, of course, agree with everything my co-author has just said, uh, but I will say something different because I was asked to reflect on a different topic. Um, but in many ways, I may end up in a very similar spot as Steve, perhaps unsurprisingly. But I was asked um, to talk about and to give some reflections on the case of Weimar Germany. So Weimar Germany, of course, was Germany's first very, very brief experiment with democracy that came about after World War I, 15 year experiment. And I wanna think about that case and dig into that case a bit uh, in my 15 minutes to think about what's, what are some lessons of that case. There's of course a lot uh, that one could say about this, uh, but I really wanna emphasize just one main lesson and, and I'll get to that, um, that I think the Weimar um, experience can help us, help teach us about the contemporary moment. So I should say at the outset uh, that one should always proceed with caution when thinking about historical analogies. And one should be especially cautious uh, when analogizing from uh, Weimar Germany and, it, and its collapse because it was such an extreme case that the calamity, the calamity of the outcome is of course extreme. And it's quite easy, I think, to actually draw false lessons from the Weimar experience. But Weimar Germany and Hitler's rise to power in January 1933, which, which ended the, the democratic experiment, is really, I think, inex inescapable for us. We have to confront it because it just looms so large over all of our discussions of democracy's uh, fate today. In fact, I think you know, more than looming, it actually really haunts us. It haunts, haunts a lot of people. So why exactly? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons why the Weimar experiment and experience haunts us today. First, lots of social scientists uh, came of age in the post-war period uh, for whom the pre in the pre-war period, uh, it was a very common thing to admire German political development. So if calamity could strike an economically advanced and culturally sophisticated Germany, it could happen anywhere. So to put it in kind of more social scientific terms, few social science facts are as firmly established as the idea that rich democracies don't die. National GDP per capita, simply appears to almost inoculate countries from democratic breakdown. And yet when Germany democratized in 1918 and when it died 15 years later in 1933, it was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Germany was richer than France, uh, richer than Denmark, richer than Sweden, and nearly as rich as Great Britain. It had a big middle class. It had a powerful working class, which was organized into a successful and increasingly self-confident social democratic party that was fully committed to democracy. Germany had a vibrant civil society and it possessed a robust rule of law tradition admired all around the world at the time. And even Weimar's constitution itself written in 1919 was written by the brilliant jurist Hugo Preuss and the eminent sociologists who all social scientists like to read, Max Weber himself. 
So given all of this, the question is what went wrong? One of the uh, eyewitnesses to Germany's demise, uh, Karl Lowenstein, who was a liberal political scientist who escaped from Germany and immigrated to the US in the 1930s, um, ending up, by the way, at Amherst College, where his papers all sit, uh, by the way. Um, he wrote an essay in 1937 that um, actually appeared in the American Political Science Review. And he was assessing the lessons you know, before the war, of course, 1937, of the Weimar experience as a liberal. And he wrote, uh, wrote a sentence. He wrote, democracy is the Trojan horse by which the enemy enters the city. Democracy is the Trojan horse by which the enemy enters the city. So Lowenstein was a Democrat. He was a liberal. But he thought the Weimar experience exposed a really a deep vulnerability of democracy. Now, you might think that Lowenstein is, in a sense, referring to the vulnerability that Steve just described in his comments, that voters can elect an autocrat to power that democracy can die at the ballot box. I mean, this would be a great paradox of democracy. And this is in fact correct, but it actually only tells half the story of what Lowenstein was describing. Because a major underappreciated threat to democracy in Weimar was not the masses of illiberal voters or majorities of voters who might vote an autocrat into power. Uh, that's certainly the fear that I think animates those who fear uh, populism in the contemporary world, that the kind of great unwashed masses and majorities will vote autocrats into power. But that isn't the, quite the right lesson, I think, to learn from Weimar. Because remember, before it came to power, the Nazi party's uh, membership never really peaked more than 2% of the population. And Hitler's Nazi party never got more than 33% of the vote in free and fair elections before democracy's death in January 1933. At the peak of their power, they had only 33% of the vote. Now, during the Weimar era, of course, there were certainly large pluralities of voters in favor of the Nazis. And this was a malignant and destructive social movement that posed a genuine threat to German democracy. But we have to remember that nearly 70% of Germans voted against Hitler at the very peak of its popularity, 70%. So, so what's the point? The point here is that as important as the Trojan horse of democracy may have been, just as important were the gatekeepers who let the Nazis into power. So to put it differently, authoritarians come to power, they come into office, not on their own, but with the enabling aid of political allies from inside the political establishment. This is a central lesson of the Weimar breakdown. Adolf Hitler didn't come to power on his own. He was a marginal figure, uh, clearly in the early 1920s, jailed in 1923 after his infamous and failed beer hall putsch. And his big break and his party's big break came in 1928, 29, simultaneously with the Great Depression, which obviously played a role in all of this. But another key part of this story that what, what else happened in 1928, 29, was that Germany's relatively mainstream conservative party, the Dan Falpe or the German National People's Party, uh, was faltering. So this was a party of essentially of Germany's aristocrats. This was the party who admired British Tory party. They kind of wanted to be like the British Tory party. They hadn't really fully accepted the Weimar constitution, but it was a quite weak party. It was nothing, nothing at all like the British Tory party because it was such a weak aristocratic party. So this party was faltering, the German conservative party, the Dan Falpe, and their leaders, their new leader in particular in 1928, began to reach out to Adolf Hitler's group. Seeing all of this energy on this side of the spectrum, seeing people marching in the streets, uh, that leader of the Dan Falpe thought, well, maybe we can tap into some of this. So he issued his party, the, the German Conservative Party, issued joint proclamation with Hitler. They made joint appearances and held joint rallies. All of this with the aim of shoring up the popularity of this kind of decrepit German Tory party. The strategy backfired. This establishment party went into a tailspin and it was only Hitler's party that gained in respectability. And that's not all. Because what also happened was in January, 1933, um, after Hitler's party's successful election in the fall of 1932, the aging president von Hindenburg decided a way of taming Hitler from this growing threat um, was to appoint Hitler chancellor. And so when conservative uh, German statesman Franz von Papen, who had sort of hatched this plan, tried to ease the worries of his conservative allies about Hitler's appointment to chancellor, he, he said to them in famous words, infamous words, don't worry, Within two months, Wolf pushed Hitler so far into a corner, he'll squeal. So it's harder to imagine a bigger miscalculation. It was an elite miscalculation. It was an abdication that gave Germany Hitler. Now, this didn't just happen in Germany. 
A similar story can be told about Italy in the 1920s. I mean, we all know about uh, Mussolini's legendary march on Rome. Um, or at least that's the usual story of how Mussolini came to power. So on April October 30th, 1922, Mussolini arrived in Rome at the Rome uh, train station, an overnight sleeping car from Northern Italy. He had been invited to Rome by the king to accept the premiership and to form a new cabinet. Uh, Mussolini arrived in the capital city and with a small group of guards, he stopped off at his hotel. He was wearing a black jacket, a black shirt, a black bowler cap and walked triumphantly to the king's palace. The street, streets of Rome were a little bit chaotic. There were bands of his black shirt fascists, not really with, all, with mismatched uniforms, roaming the streets. Mussolini, who was always aware of the spectacle and the power of the spectacle, wrote, strode into the, king, the king's palace and said to the king, sir, forgive my attire, I come from the battlefield. So this was Mussolini's legendary march in Rome. So the, the point here though, is that his flair for the dramatic totally outpaced real events. This kind of fascist myth of 300,000 black shirts crossing the Rubicon to seize power. Um, this was repeated often in national holidays and children's school books through the fascist era, but this, and he, Mussolini did everything he could to reinforce this legend. And actually one funny bit of the story was that right before the train arrived in Rome, he considered disembarking from the train and to ride into the city on horseback, but at the last minute kind of abandoned that plan. But the point is that he was trying to give the, foment this myth of a kind of mass insurrection, kind of mass uh, underpinnings of, of his fascist revolution. The truth, of course, though, was much more mundane. The bulk of Mussolini's black shirts really arrived only after Mussolini had been appointed prime minister in a very constitutional process. Um, it, the black shirts were quite disorganized. There was no real march on Rome. The black shirts talked a lot about it, but it didn't really happen. So rather than high political drama, and it was essentially a kind of negotiation with uh, the king that allowed him into power. He used his 35 seats in the parliament out of 500 deputies uh, as a point of leverage along with threats of violence and divisions among establishment politicians to catapult himself into power. Uh, and so King Victor Emmanuel saw this political star on the horizon and thought a way of neutralizing the fascist unrest was to bring him into government. Again, elite abdication. And just a final note about Mussolini, the way he got those 35 seats to begin with was earlier in the year, he had convinced the liberal Italian statesman, aging Italian statesman Giovanni Giletti to include Mussolini's party on the liberal, very much establishment party, liberal party's list of, of uh, for parliamentary elections. To, um, again, Giletti thought he was doing this to give himself a boost. Instead, within a year, Giletti was long gone and Mussolini was in power. Again, I don't want to minimize the power of fascist and authoritarian social movements. They were real, they are real today. My point is simply that when extremists first arrive on the scene and appear to threaten democracy, they should be taken seriously and marginalized and not embraced for short run gain, which only helps bolster their legitimacy. Second, critically also, even more critically perhaps, when anti-democratic demagogues or parties are on the precipice of power, mainstream politicians must do everything possible to form coalitions, even sometimes very uncomfortable coalitions with parties they may disagree with and even dislike, but who accept the basic democratic rules of the game all in order to keep extremists out. This didn't happen in Weimar, Germany. This didn't happen in 1920s Italy, but it was possible and it actually it did happen elsewhere. So just very briefly consider uh, from the same time period in 1930s Belgium, far right fascist party inspired by the Nazis, Nazis the Rexis party was on the verge of gaining power through a coalition with a right wing Catholic group uh, party. And so they, the Rexis party had its own march on Brussels uh, mimicking uh, Mussolini's. But in this instance, the Belgian king used his moral authority to convince socialists and Catholics who are sworn enemies in normal everyday parliamentary politics to cooperate, to keep the Rexists out. So again, the lesson of these stories is that mainstream politicians and parties have a key role to play. When they abdicate that role, when they, when they, when they fail to serve their gatekeeping role out of miscalculation, out of opportunism, extremists get let in the door. This kind of Faustian bargain between establishment politicians and anti-democratic uh, extremist demagogues and parties is a Faustian bargain that usually backfires. Establishment politicians usually lose control. So what are the lessons of this, these historical experiences? Well, I think something similar, clearly in different scale, different 
um, setting, different time, but something similar happened in the United States in 2016. The Republican Party, a Republican establishment, enabled Donald Trump. Meeting leading Republicans, even after candidate Trump won the election, um, clearly openly despised him, thought he was not fit for office, were offended by Donald Trump. And they could have crossed party lines. They could have, but they didn't endorse the Democratic nominee. This is in 2016. They could have put, in effect, democracy ahead of party. And this could have made a huge difference. But as we have seen, when politicians don't do this, when they let some, a politician in the door with autocratic tendencies, it's a changed game. So um, when Steve and I wrote our book uh, back in 2018, How Democracies Die, we wrote it in part because we had expected and hoped that Republicans would stand up to President Trump. We wanted to send the message of this, uh, this lesson that I'm describing right now. We want to send the lesson that if, that if President Trump crossed the line, the Republicans should step up to it, to, to confront this and kind of draw a line on the sand. Um, and, and so I think in many ways, we, we uh, underestimated the threat because Republicans never quite did this. And the result is our calamity today. So my main point then, and a lesson from the Weimar experiments, experiment, experience is that the rise of demagogues um, who find popular support is certainly a threat to democracy. But it's a threat that's often present. You know, around 35% of the American electorate has, has supported demagogues going back to Henry Ford, Father Coughlin, Joseph McCarthy, George Wallace throughout American history. So popular support for demagogues, even extensive popular support for demagogues is not sufficient to kill democracy. A key role in the past in the United States as well as in other countries has been played by establishment politicians and parties. So the question that I'll kind of end with here then is when do politicians and parties, mainstream politicians and parties act as successful gatekeepers? Is this simply a matter of political courage? I think that's certainly part of it. And I think it's also part of it is understanding the scale of the threat. And that's sort of one of the kind of hopes that I have is that coming out of this experience, people will understand the scale of these kinds of threats. But more than that, I think there's one last thing we can say, which is that it also requires, and this is where I begin to converge with Steve's message here, it also requires that mainstream political parties not be so fearful of the other side that they're willing to overlook abuses on their own side. So in other words, Polarization, that's fear of the other side, and also fear of the future makes establishment politicians, leads of establishment politicians to fail in their jobs as gatekeepers. So I think the biggest problem and challenge for our democracy today is that our Republican party is, as Steve said, in some senses analogous to the German conservatives, fearful of the future, representing a declining segment of the electorate. Uh, and until the Republican party itself changes, our democracy will be vulnerable. So just like the German aristocrats who are fearful of the future uh, and willing to abdicate and, and, and make mistakes that they knew at the time were a danger, uh, America's Republican Party has done very similar things and I think major reforms need to come. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, wouldn't call it exactly uplifting, but certainly informative and, and important and I appreciate, we all appreciate it. Um, Niti. Uh, tell us about, just fast forward to the present and, and tell us about uh, uh, the, uh, the subcontinent. Okay, so by way of introduction, I thought I would begin my presentation by considering where uh, India's Prime Minister Modi stands on the litmus test for authoritarianism provided by Levitsky and Ziblatt in their book. Um, so they provide us with these four key indicators of authoritarian behavior. The first one, let's see, does Mr. Modi show weak commitment to the democratic rules of the game? Yes, in his second innings as prime minister alone, uh, these have been bookended by the undemocratic abrogation of Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, revoking Kashmir's autonomy without consulting Kashmiri elected representatives, and most very recently, the passage of important legislation pertaining to agricultural produce that was bulldozed through parliament with a mere voice vote, cacophonous and confusing, despite key government allies quitting the ruling coalition over this piece of legislation and a walkout by the opposition. The second indicator, does Mr. Modi deny the legitimacy of political opponents? 
Mr. Modi has campaigned twice on the promise of giving Indians a Congress Mukt Bharat and India free of its grand old party, the Indian National Congress. Not only does Mr. Modi show scant respect for parliamentary norms and the opposition, of late, even the opposition has been oblivious of its place in a democracy. Three, does Mr. Modi tolerate or encourage violence? Yes, of course. The government led by Mr. Modi has been turning a blind eye to growing instances of cow vigilantism and Muslim baiting in its first term. And this has gotten a lot of international reportage. Um, in its second term, it has overseen a riot in the capital city of Delhi, where Delhi police falls under the jurisdiction, not of the government of Delhi, but of the Ministry of Home Affairs under the central government. And all of this happened while President Trump was in fact visiting India. Um, there's a lot more to be said of Mr. Modi's past credentials as rabble, uh, as rabble rouser in chief when he was chief minister of the state of Gujarat, especially during 2002, if one were to take a longer term view. His leadership then resulted in his being denied a visa to the United States. Even the newfound popularity of Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's assassin, Nathuram Godse is related to Mr. Modi's toleration of very specific kinds of violence and violent speech. Finally, the fourth indicator is Mr. Modi ready to curtail the civil liberties of opponents, including the media. Yes, independent media has been viciously targeted, especially by Mr. Modi's troll army. While most, but not all, of mainstream media houses have taken to reporting government propaganda as news. Those who have resisted are being denied government advertisements, a source of revenue, and also hounded with tax evasion cases. Individual activists and conscientious civil servants associated with, for instance, the Election Commission of India, a key institution, have also been targeted by the government for their independence and unwillingness to toe the official line. So there we have it. Mr. Modi and his government embody authoritarianism. They pass the litmus test with flying colors. However, unlike the case of Mr. Trump, Mr. Modi does not fall into the prototype of the outsider who was allowed in to lead his political party by gatekeepers or by establishment politicians who should have known better. Those who made way for Mr. Modi to lead the BJP in 2014, including former president of the party, L.K. Advani, were as extremist as he. They were schooled in the same Hindu supremacist ideology of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh or the RSS. Mr. Modi represents the high point of the Hindu nationalist dream, which is why he can speak so disparagingly of the opposition. In this dream of a Hindu Rashtra or a Hindu nation, there is no need for an opposition, especially one tied to Western ideas of democracy and secularism. These Hindu nationalists would argue for an Indian style democracy and secularism that is able to show Muslims, Christians and the lowest castes their place, even while making some exceptions. Now, what makes the India case more complicated? is that at least some of these authoritarian features are not new. Yes, Mr. Modi's government showed weak commitment to democracy by revoking Article 370 unilaterally, but the article that originally provided a pathway for Kashmir to retain some degree of autonomy within the Indian Union had already been whittled down to its barest bones during previous tenures of the Congress government. Kashmir had little autonomy even in name. Even the popular appeal of Gandhi's assassin, Nathuram Godse, is not entirely new. In the first general elections of 1951, one of the members of the Defense Council for the assassins, P.L. Inamdar of the Hindu Mahasabha, won the elections because of his celebrity status as a defense lawyer in the trial. If you read the intelligence reports on that election campaign, you could be forgiven for mistaking the slogans hailing Gandhi's assassin to the recent election campaign of 2019. But what has happened is a dismissal of that era's Hindu fundamentalism and the positing instead of a narrative that foregrounds Nehru's Nehruvian secularism to the exclusion of all other ideas of India. That has led to a lack of reckoning with some of the more lasting consequences of the partition of the Indian subcontinent.
the Hindu nationalist promise, the dream of an undivided India or an Akhand Bharat lay dormant but never died. It is also important to acknowledge that the Modi government's massive majority is the consequence of decades of perseverance of RSS cadres. To be sure, having a team that excelled in social media, targeted advertising and propaganda has been crucial in capturing attention in a new, heavily mediatized environment. However, beneath the noise of social media, the trolls are millions of real people who have been indoctrinated into the philosophy of the RSS in schools and through attending workshops and the Indian equivalent of Sunday schools, RSS shakhas. The opposition parties in India, be it the Congress or the communist parties or an assortment of regional parties have nothing equivalent, nor have they the moral courage to face the BJP's charges of pseudo secularism and Muslim appeasement with either a responsive politics or concrete policies. As a result, Muslims in India as a community are now barely represented in parliament. They are 4.3% of elected members as opposed to comprising 14% of the population. From Kashmir to Manipur to Chhattisgarh, India is full of spaces where the rule of law has been a cover for extreme lawlessness. For too long, neither the drumbeat of elections nor recourse to the judiciary has provided the, the people in these margins with respite from forces that were allegedly legal. Now with the riots in Delhi earlier this year, this lawlessness mas masquerading under the cover of rule of law has come to the heart of India to its capital city. And yet, I hold that India, because of its many regional political parties that can and have come together in the past, its enormously diverse and strong civil society, most recently in evidence during protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019, its independent media that fact checks the daily myths spun by Hindu nationalist mouthpieces, and some of its still independent judiciary can withstand this latest grave crisis to its democracy. If there is a silver lining to Mr. Modi's ascendance, it is that it has forced a dispassionate long overdue reckoning of the limitations of Indian's electoral democracy. The greatest strength of the Indian National Congress Party was its ability to grow, to evolve, to debate with multiple stakeholders and then be persuaded to take up a particular cause. We see this in colonial India when the Congress Party moved from representing a microscopic minority to becoming a mass movement under Gandhi in the early 1920s. The party co-opted Muslims briefly. It sought to co-opt Dalits by subsuming their identity under a common general electorate to keep the fiction of a majority Hindu community. Under Nehru and Indira Gandhi, the Congress allied with socialists and communists. It forged electoral alliances across castes and classes. But after a point, it began to brook absolutely no dissent. This happened in the 1970s, just as Mrs. Indira Gandhi came under the sway of her son, Sanjay Gandhi, and a coterie of unelected power brokers. What followed was the emergency, a suspension of the constitution that lasted 20 months. It is a measure of the seriousness with which Indira Gandhi regarded her political opponents that she had them imprisoned. In Modi's India, the Congress party doesn't even merit that much of a response. The people being jailed today are student activists, civil society leaders, anyone with a following who criticized the Modi government and whose words can be framed and distorted to warrant the label anti-national. The question for India's democracy is, can a grand coalition be forged to keep Mr. Modi's BJP from getting a third term, a term that will irretrievably cast India into an unqualified Hindu majoritarian nation, a nation that many will argue has already come into being. The next general elections are a little over three years away. The good news is I think it can be safely said that they will be held. There will be problems and corrupt practices as far as campaign finances are concerned, just as they were in 2019, and that will have consequences for political parties and electoral outcomes, but the elections will be held. <laughs>
And if the past can be held to be a guide for the future, the defeated will allow for a peaceful transfer of power. And I say that because in the past, even if it has taken weeks to prove that the government, that the coalition has a majority, um, it typically there has been no resistance from the defeated. There are certain democratic norms in place. If the opposition can put together a grand coalition with a program that emphasizes growth with redistribution, if it can run a campaign with enough energy and sustenance to thwart the gains that may be made from any contrived or real national security crisis, a rally around the flag moment as happened on the eve of the last general election, if it is transparent in its composition agenda long before the first vote is cast, and if it can put forward a leader whose own life story resonates with aspirational India, there is room for hope. The Indian people deserve to know, away from the proverbial smoke-filled ro rooms of yore, who it is who will lead such a coalition government since Indian elections too have become presidential of late. This majoritarian hatred coursing through India is not new. The months and years following the 1947 partition of India witnessed much worse. But the leadership at the helm of India took concerted measures to stem the hatred, even if in retrospect one might argue they could have done more than ban the RSS for just six months, for instance. Today, there is a quiet stirring among elements in the corporate sector and the Hindi film industry even the hate fanning sections of the news media have just come under legal scrutiny. There are examples from India's own history of putting together lasting coalitions. But winning the battle for democracy at the hustings will still only be a small beginning in a long journey to making India genuinely democratic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niti. This is, uh, we're moving toward optimism and uh, it's it's a, it's a reaffirmation which uh, I was hoping we we might have and uh, especially now as we transition to Susan, um, we're looking for more reaffirmation closer to home. Thanks, Niti. Uh, Susan, your turn. Um, well, I cannot promise that I will deliver optimism um, here, but uh, thank you so much for for that introduction and and I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, I note a little bit of protest at being forced to go last after those um, really excellent presentations, but I, you know there is a certain logic in, in uh, you know saving uh, a uh, examination of our own country for a last and, and really thinking about how our own system of government really interacts with the kinds of pressures that have caused democratic erosion and even collapse in other countries. Um, so I was asked to speak today about sort of the prospect of constitutional crisis here in the United States. Um, this is a term that's it's received a lot of attention over the past four and a half years, um, but it's actually not um, a term that has a standard sort of historical or legal or constitutional definition. This idea of a constitutional crisis. Um, it's kind of this amorphous term that, that tends to sort of generally describe the circumstances in which the constitutional order itself Self is threatened. Um, and in the United States, we often think about it in terms of sort of a discrete precipitating event um, in which the order is imperiled. Um, and then in all historical cases, the order is then restored. Um, and this can take a, a number of different forms. And there isn't even agreement on um, uh, whether or not sort of the, the typical examples should fully qualify. Um, so obviously the civil war itself is kind of an, uh, the extreme form of constitutional crisis. Um, but even within that, whenever we examine the presidency, um, we have a pretty good example of a, of a constitutional crisis, which is that Abraham Lincoln unilaterally suspends habeas, uh, openly admitting that he's violating the constitution um, and really saying, you know, are all laws but one uh, to go unexecuted and the government falls apart. And so what Lincoln is arguing there um, is saying, well, I have these dueling constitutional constitutional mandates. Uh, yes, I'm uh, supposed to faithfully take care that the laws are faithfully executed, but it also have the, man the mandate to, uh, to protect and preserve the Constitution of the United States. And, and therefore, I can breach the law and breach the Constitution, and I'm doing that consistent with my duty. Um, that's a moment of constitutional crisis, and the way it's ultimately healed is that Lincoln eventually has to go to Congress to seek ratification. So this process of sort of tension and healing where uh, we're sort of 
rifts are resolved. Um, the most sort of familiar modern example tends to be the Saturday Night Massacre in which uh, Richard Nixon uh, fires the special prosecutor uh, investigating him. Um, even that is not sort of an ideal case um, uh, because Nixon is then forced to appoint a new special prosecutor and, and eventually has to resign. And so um, uh, sort of reasonable minds can argue that, well, that's actually a case, uh, an example of the way in which our system works um, uh, and demonstrates its resiliency to these kinds of stressors. Um, so the constitutional crisis, it's, it's an important term, but it's sort of squishy. Um, and I don't know that it's the best framework to understand this particular moment. Um, and I think that the analogy, the more useful analogy of this moment is constitutional rot. Um, we are unlikely at this point to be faced with sort of a single event that shatters the system. Um, and we've seen lots of events over the past four years that we might have predicted decades ago would precipitate a genuine crisis that haven't. Um, so instead, what we're seeing is a sort of slow erosion over time. Um, where at the end, you're left with the constitutional structure. The institutions still exist, the processes still exist, we still observe the technicalities of the constitutional form, um, but they're hollowed out and they're stripped not just of their legitimacy, um, but they actually no longer fulfill their intended constitutional purpose. Um, and I think that's the way to understand sort of the specific moment that we're in. Um, and I certainly agree with the prior panelists um, that we are experiencing a really alarming erosion under President Trump. Um, and I, I'd suggest that the election prevents, presents sort of a definitive moment that's gonna set us on a path whereby either this rot begins to accelerate rather quickly, um, or instead it's a turning point. And the turning point is only the beginning of a process, of, of a really difficult process of restoration. Um, but in order to understand sort of where we are and how we got here, um, I think it's, it's really important to understand sort of the structure and fundamental nature of the American presidency um, and how it's kind of unlike any other executive uh, structure anywhere else in the world. Um, and that's that, the founding fathers created an astonishingly powerful executive. So they create, they create the American president. They say it's gonna be just one person. Um, they vest that person with all of the Article II powers. He's the commander in chief of the military. He appoints and supervises all of the heads of agencies and cabinet departments. He can fire them. He can make treaties with foreign governments. He gets to uh, appoint ambassadors uh, and judges with advice and consent. He has the power to veto legislation, right? This is, uh, this is an aggregation of powers uh, in a single person that we don't see elsewhere in the world. Um, and instead, we've decided to give it to just one person. Um, and there's a lot of sort of uh, controversy in the um, uh, legal, uh, uh, the, the sort of legal academic community about sort of the precise contours of this theory of the unitary executive. Um, but at a sense, it, it's just the basic constitutional reality. We only have one president um, and the executive branch is not actually legally distinct from the president. So while we think of sort of this sprawling bureaucracy, um, it's really just kind of the president's the head and the bureaucracy is his arms and fingers. Um, and so it's this really powerful thing. Um, and we do, the founders do this um, on purpose and they do it fully understanding sort of that they are opening themselves up to the risk of abuse. Um, and the reason the founding fathers decide to do this, and, and this is sort of best articulated in the Federalist Papers and by Alexander Hamilton, um, sort of the, uh, the foremost proponent um, uh, for this vision of the executive that ultimately prevails, is this notion that you need to have energy in the executive. Um, you know, we, have a, we had a historical uh, sort of colonial tradition um, uh, early on of kind of a, eviscerated uh, governors, overpower uh, uh, overly empowered legislatures uh, leading up to the Constitutional Convention. They wanted to correct for that. And, and basically the idea is if you want a government that does things, that actually can act and act decisively and with, uh, with dispatch and secrecy, um, you know, and, and do these really important things in the national interest, you have to let the person do that. And, and you can't require them to do that by committee. Um, and so they, they try and sort of remove, they, they contemplate it. One, having more than one president, having something like a presidential committee, and two, having sort of other checks like, well, maybe the president has to get permission uh, from cabinet secretaries in order to, to take particular action. And they decide intentionally not to do that because this concept of energy, uh, it's sort of a, a robust executive it, is really important. Um, and because the, uh, the, uni the unitary nature of the executive and of, and of an empowered executive brings accountability 
Um, in the United States, we know exactly who to blame. We know who to blame for Obamacare. We know who to blame for the Iraq war. We know who to blame when a, a, a pandemic response is catastrophically mismanaged. Um, whether you support or, or oppose any of sort of, you know, we, there's hundreds of things we can list. Um, at the end of the day, we know where the buck ultimately stops. And that form of accountability um, is really, really important because what happens is it leads to the development of this really rich and elaborate tapestry of norms that exist on top of the core powers of the American presidency. Um, but notably, whenever we talk about the abuses that we've seen over the past four years uh, in the Trump era and in the Trump administration, um, by and large, we aren't talking about presidents that are overstepping the edges of their constitutional power. We're talking about abuses of core powers things that a president is sort of, um, you know, uh, there's, there's no controversy uh, that the president in fact has the ability to issue pardons. There's no controversy that the president does in fact have the ability to fire an FBI director. Uh, there, there's no controversy that the president is, is actually allowed to tweet out that we're withdrawing forces sort of based on a whim uh, from Syria, based on, on a sort of a whim one morning. Um, <clears throat> But the, uh, so the, these, these norms that have uh, uh, sort of hem in the president are directly responsive to this notion of strong political accountability and then of course backstopped by the structural separation of powers and the other branches. Um, it's important to note that not all of these norms are good and they are not in any way static over time. Um, the American presidency is a flexible and evolving institution and it's changed a lot even in important and very controversial ways. So we aren't able to point to a president breaching a norm and saying that's bad and we need to prevent that from happening. Um, because in some cases, every president has breached norms and in some cases it ends up being a positive thing. Um, <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson, for example, sort of dramatically changed the way we understand presidential rhetoric uh, and how the president communicates with the public, right? He's the first president who really uh, directly engages uh, sort of making a policy case to the American people rather than to Congress. You know, prior presidents had thought that that was a form of sort of demagoguery that, that, that was, was intolerable um, and was really something that we should avoid. Um, you know, the two term, uh, the two term tradition, for example, um, you know, George Washington serves for, for two terms, he steps down, Adams follows, uh, Jefferson follows after that, and we have this idea of there being a two term tradition. Um, now, whenever we think about the rhetoric, uh, the, Wilson wins reelection, um, and the office has changed forever. And this, our, our understanding of how presidents communicate to the public is, is permanently altered and, and is considered um, uh, sort of a, a core power and, and feature of the presidency moving forward. Um, the two-term tradition, on the other hand, um, we sort of, we care about this norm and we talk a lot about what would happen if somebody tried to violate it in, in sort of the early republic. Um, some people try. So uh, President Grant tries to run for a third term. He doesn't win. So we say, well, don't worry about it. Uh, the norm holds and the American public enforces it and cares about it. Um, and then FDR goes on to, to win a third term and a fourth term. And we say, well, we really care about this. And so um, we're going to pass the 22nd Amendment and, and create an amendment process to prevent this moving forward. So this is, this is an institution that evolves in conversation with the constitution in which breaches of the uh, sort of breaches of norms uh, uh, you know, can actually lead to, to, to positive and sort of in, in, in dramatic changes. Um, in some cases we reject them, in some cases uh, we incorporate them into our constitutional system moving forward. Um, Trump's breach of ethics are of a different character and nature. It's, it's, under, it's important to understand uh, sort of the normative breaches of this moment through that particular lens. Um, so there's lots and lots of examples to pick from. Um, I think the best one is probably ethics. Um, so the, the uh, drafters of the constitution care a lot about ethics. Um, they care about principles of good governance. They care about this basic idea that elected officials are acting on behalf of the public and not in financial interests, not in their own personal financial interests, not because of any kind of, uh, of undue influence over them. And this really matters to sort of our core constitutional structure because we're moving away from a system where legitimacy is derived uh, by, uh, by, by, by uh, sort of birth, right? This is, this is legitimacy derived from, from the people. And so um, if we don't guard against corruption, we, we have a real problem on our hands. Um, and so the founders do a few things. Um, they create the emoluments clauses. 
Um, they have the structural separation of powers. They, they give certain powers to Congress that, that, that they think might be especially ripe for abuse. Um, but then lots and lots of norms develop over time. It, it's sort of this area where scandals happen and, and norms develop and, and new sort of uh, uh, ethics regulations are, are developed. And most of them don't apply to the president. Um, but we have these three sort of uh, rules of good governance and ethics. Um, we expect that uh, officials uh, disclose, divest from any conflicts, uh, and also uh, recuse if they have conflicts of interest. Um, you know, this is just sort of the, the, the bread and butter of, of federal ethics rules. Um, most presidents, um, while they are not technically required to abide by those rules, because again, we want to preserve that flexibility. We don't want to uh, sort of bind a president's hands in cases in which we want him or her to be able to take action. Um, but presidents care a lot about trying to preserve the appearance that they are playing by the rules. So presidents traditionally divest from their businesses, or at least they pretend to. Um, so LBJ sort of secretly held control of his uh, family's radio business is, is a good example, um, but he pretends. Um, Ronald Reagan makes a, a sort of an elaborate point of seeking counsel so that he can accept his pension from, uh, from the state of California, and it's not in violation of the Emoluments Clause. Obama does this in accepting the monetary award of the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so presidents at least are attempting to abide by these norms and rules because it's directly tied to their legitimacy. Um, Trump comes in and instead offers a really, really different proposal. Um, and it's a proposal that we call in the, the book, the I dare you principle. Um, the idea that he's going to do whatever he is permitted to do unless and until somebody stops him. Um, and he, this is an area in which Donald Trump has made his uh, a large and radically successful bet. Um, so Donald Trump bet that the American voters didn't really care that much about his tax returns. He bet he could win election anyway, and he was right. We'll see whether or not he can win re-election on that principle, but he is accurate. Um, he bet that he didn't really have to divest from his businesses because the courts either wouldn't be able to get to it in time or would tolerate it and that Congress would ultimately tolerate it. Um, he was right about that. And so over time, um, we've seen him sort of put this proposition on the table. The proposition essentially is that a president doesn't have to abide by sort of the, the standards of ethics and good governance. Um, and that's the proposition that's on the table whenever we talk about uh, what's at stake in this election. Because just like sort of uh, uh, reforms around rhetoric or, or the way uh, courts, uh, the way the, uh, the judiciary uh, has been nominated, another feature where there's been sort of uh, dramatic, dramatic normative shifts uh, over the past 20 and 30 years. Um, if a president breaches a norm and then wins re-election, he demonstrates to the American public and to all future presidents that this is uh, that this is not a norm that really matters. This is a norm that is flexible and can be breached. Um, that's coming at a moment in which we're seeing institutional sort of um, uh, erosion and collapse of the very uh, uh, structure uh, of the very constitutional constitutional powers that are designed to uh, to uh, hem a president in. Um, so basically, we're seeing Congress not do its job. Um, we're seeing it in a lot of different categories. Um, so one area, for example, uh, uh, the, the uh, principle of, of advice and consent. And um, when the president nominates somebody, uh, a cabinet official, he's supposed to go to Congress and Congress has to confirm that person. That is a core constitutional check and balance. It is essential to our system. Um, Donald Trump has said he prefers acting. He likes the flexibility. He rejects the constitutional principle. And Congress in response, has shrugged. Congress passed a law saying there's a 10 year term for an FBI director following the abuses of J. Edgar Hoover. They did that because they wanted this principle of an accountable FBI director, a sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a generally publicly accountable. They didn't want to have too much independence, but also not, they didn't want the FBI director to be a political appointee. Donald Trump fired Jim Comey and Congress shrugged. Now, if he fires Christopher Wray, and Congress shrugs again, the FBI director moving forward will be a political appointee. That profoundly changes our understanding of how our constitutional structure interacts uh, you know, with our sort of rights in the real world. Um, lastly, and I think most significantly, the place where we've seen institutional collapse by Congress in, in significant ways is around the idea, around the power of impeachment. 
Um, so not just the failure to convict based on uh, the, the impeachment related to Ukraine, um, a demonstration that the impeachment power is in fact just a, a sort of a raw voting, uh, a, a, raw vo uh, a raw count of the number of votes that the president uh, has in the Senate at the number of uh, members of the president's party in the Senate at a given moment, a really, really significant collapse. Um, but also the things that we, that the Congress has chosen not to impeach on, including prototypical impeachable offenses like abuses of the pardon power. Um, <clears throat> We've seen Congress outsource their, investig their investigation and oversight capacity, uh, largely to the executive branch that is controlled by the president. And so all of these abuses amount to a sort of proposition. Um, Donald Trump is proposing um, that it is tolerable and good for a president to interact with the powers of, the, of his office the way he has. Um, and the problem is that the election is a pretty blunt instrument. It's a moment in which we either ratify or reject uh, this, this sort of vision of the presidency. Um, and it comes at a moment in which the Electoral College, which was in part designed uh, to prevent the public from electing populist demagogues, um, and instead uh, it has sort of inverted the public's judgment. So when the public has rejected uh, somebody like Donald Trump in the popular vote, the Electoral College has rebalanced the scales in his favor. Um, the challenge though, is that this is a very, very blunt instrument. And so if Donald Trump does win re-election, he demonstrates that under our existing system, uh, one can win re-election this way. And, and, and so I, I do think that that's the moment at which if it does in fact come to pass, um, we are going to see uh, not just the, the abuses we've seen over the past four years, um, but, but really a dramatic and consequential acceleration and, and, and one that is going to be um, uh, really quite significant moving forward. Thank you very much, Susan. And thanks to all the panelists for uh, providing so much stimulation uh, on such a difficult topic. Um, we have a we have about 15 minutes left and, and we have a large number of questions and Daniel um, has got to go off and, and earn a living. He's got to teach a class. So um, before he leaves, I wanted to pick out a couple of, of the questions that were addressed to, to Daniel and um, or at least one in particular, uh, which is, um, and, and both are specific, I think, um, uh, uh, to particular countries in Western Europe, which is, which is what you know so well. Um, no, I just lost it here. I'll pull it back up. Um, uh, the first, is, this one is from uh, Gianluca, who, who asks whether you think Salvini's recent demise in, in Italy is a case of uh, a moderate coalition, the five stars and the Democrats, being built to insulate democracy from pop, Italian democracy from populism, or is there, I mean, is, is this something, is this the way you would explain it? And, and the second is, um, a neighbor, in a way, um, in, in, in Southern Europe, uh, which is uh, Bosnia. And the question has come up about civil war and whether or not we used the wrong uh, example before in, 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 in some of the cases we invoked. Um, and, and maybe we should be thinking about the Bosnian example. Um, so um, I wonder if you want to address those two before you disappear. Yeah, I maybe have less to say about the Bosnian example, unfortunately, but the, but I can say something about the Italian example, and I think there's a more general lesson that I mean, I think in general, yes, I mean that that, that is one way of interpreting what's happened, um, the the kind of ejection of extremist wing of um, you know extremist threats. I mean, it's one one interesting thing about European right wing populists is uh, kind of, there's a kind of debate over the degree to which they're a th they are a threat to democracy, or are they simply anti-immigrant parties that have differing policy positions within and accept the basic rules of the democratic game. And I think there's actually variations across Europe. For example, I think the AFD in Germany is pretty clearly, at least it has major strands of it that are anti-democratic, that condone and endorse violence, that, that embrace the Nazi past to varying degrees. And so, um, you know, that's a party, for instance, that I think is under no conditions should be a legitimate contender in politics. There's other countries where it's not so clear cut. So, I mean, I think in general, this strategy of, it's worth dwelling just for very briefly on this kind of strategy of consolidating the middle, as I described in Belgium, let's say in the 1930s of Catholics and socialists joining together. I mean, this is in some ways a little bit of what's happened, you might say in Germany today with the kind of grand coalition for many years or what's happened in Austria over, not right now, but in the past 
a kind of history of kind of grand coalitions where the major parties get together. And this is how Italian politics is often operated. Now, this is good for keeping out demagogic outsiders, but it's not, you know, as in life, you know, there's always trade-offs. And so the trade-off here is that while it may keep outsiders out, it does kind of create the perception from some voters of collusion, where the main parties, rather than competing with each other, don't alternate in power and just simply get together to keep outsiders out. Um, and so there's a certain cost to that for democracy. So, so as much as I think it, that it's a necessary step when facing uh, political parties that are a real threat to democracy, and at least necessary in the short run, as a long run strategy, it kind of is self undermining in the sense that it generates increased sense of disaffection from the political establishment, and it kind of creates the seeds of its own destruction in a way. And so um, I guess the way to think about this is that democracy is sometimes an acute crisis and sometimes a long term chronic problem. And when facing an acute crisis, it's worth this long term cost to keep the outsiders out, but that one should be aware that there's a cost to this kind of strategy of employing it for too long. Um, and it's very much actually the kind of move to the center of Angela Merkel with, with the SPD in Germany for so long that some people have argued it's given rise to the extremes because it's left space on the open, on the edges. So in Italy, similarly, I think, you know, this is a, this was a good short-term solution, but there's nothing that actually, I think, substitutes for clear alternations in government over time. So that, that's sort of what I, what I would suspect. And I, I, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I have less to say about Bosnia. That's all right. Um, David uh, asked the question, which, which takes, which broadens the lens uh, a bit of, and, and any of you um, uh, who are uh, so inclined, I hope will answer, uh, which is um, whether, uh, if you could explain and speak to how social media serves an ex as an accelerant for the erosion of democracy. Um, Susan mentioned, um, you know, the early morning uh, tweets and so forth, um, but, uh, but what, what might, the, David wanted to know what might we do uh, to meet the challenge, should you judge or should we judge that social media, ironically, because it's a democratizing instrument, uh, ironically, um, is a problem uh, for a democratic practice? Anyone? I'll give it a, a very brief answer, and and that's just that um, sort of the uh, the the basic assumption of uh, of our system and, and democratic systems generally is that um, voters will have access to some inform to, to information, um, and they will have some means to uh, judge whether or not it's it's sort of true and accurate. Um, and so sort of these secondary institutions, you know, social media um, and the, the traditional press um, play a really, really important role um, whenever we have a system that depends ultimately on, on sort of public accountability. Um, and so to the extent that, that social media ends up becoming used um, to distribute uh, effective propaganda in ways that actually uh, sort of uh, either make it uh, either genuinely fool people or rather make it uh, create a conditions in which the public sort of can't believe anything, um, then it becomes very, very difficult to um, uh, sort of marshal effective political coalitions and um, it sort of dramatically um, uh, increases the costs um, of actors in the system that are trying to sort of genuinely inform the public um, in order to, you know, uh, allow our policy, uh, you know, legislative and, uh, and, and executive systems uh, to be genuinely accountable. So I, that's not a solution. It's just it's a little bit of a description of um, uh, how it connects to sort of the, the, the larger problem. Could I uh, take a stab at this? Please. So this is this is not something that that I work on or know much about, but I'm, I'm a little skeptical about uh, blaming social media for the the challenges facing our democracy. A uh, couple of reasons. First of all, there is uh, we're, we've just begun in, in in political science to study the the impact of, of social media, and the the evidence that I've seen suggests that it does in fact have the the effect that we that we most of us think it has. It does tend to polarize us. It does tend us to pull to pull us towards ideological extremes. That said, I think it's, it's fair to say that social media exacerbates existing polarization, does not create the polarization that is threatening democracies in various parts of the world. And uh, the first bit of evidence seems uh, maybe uh, overly simplistic, but uh, clearly we've seen earlier periods or periods of, of polarization in history 
that have wrecked democracies prior to the rise of social media, right? The Spanish did not need WhatsApp or Facebook to descend into civil war. The United States didn't need Twitter to descend into civil war. The, the polarization that broke uh, German democracy in, in that Daniel described or Chilean democracy in the early 70s, none of that was driven by social media. So um, social media will, at, at, I think at most exacerbate underlying problems of, of, of polarization, which is not to say that it doesn't matter, but I think we shouldn't lose focus on what's really driving the polarization in, in, in this society. And just to, to, to say one other thing, scholars were terrified of radio when it emerged. It was associated with the rise of fascism. Scholars were, were worried that, that television was gonna give rise to, to demagoguery, and maybe it has, but um, we, we are running to catch up with the, with the effects of social media without question. But I think there's, there's a plausible chance that governments, politicians, and citizens eventually will figure out sort of how, will, will learn how to um, effectively, formally and informally regulate social media. I'm not sure that it's bound to destroy us. Very cool. Very quickly, uh, can I just say something on this? Because yeah. I think it's worth making this point. And then we'll that, go to Niti, yeah. Okay, oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, so please. The, yeah. Um, the, just that, you know, there's a sense in which it's easy to think that what social media does is eliminate the gatekeepers, right? It opens up the door to media, you know, free, a media free for all. But I think the reality actually is, is that it, it uh, creates new gatekeepers. You know, Mark Zuckerberg has to decide whether or not to ban uh, Holocaust deniers on his website, or the, the head of Twitter has to decide whether to allow for the reporting of stories about Hunter Biden's laptop. And these guys then are the, become the gatekeepers. And what this suggests is not the elimination, the removal of gatekeepers through the social media, but actually the new gatekeepers. And I think the, the challenge then becomes for democracies to assert regulatory control over this, because you know, if in a democracy, you would rather have democratically accountable regulators who are accountable to democratically elected politicians being the ones making these kinds of decisions rather than media uh, titans who have no regulation whatsoever. And so, you know, th there's always going to be some limits on free speech. There's, all, you know, there's always going to be a, a respect for free speech and one has to balance these, but I would rather have uh, regulators and democratically accountable uh, officials making these kinds of decisions than the un unaccountable uh, private interests. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this has become a very important live question in India. Um, some commentators, in fact, felt that the BJP had a real advantage during the 2019 elections because Mr. Modi, because their social media was a uh, uh, apparatus organization was so much, uh, you know, well honed. Um, uh, to uh, adapt to the 2019 election while the opposition candidate Rahul Gandhi barely had a presence on social media. Um, that has changed only in very recent months has he begun to tweet and put together a presence. But I also wanted to speak about um, you know, the trolls that have taken over social media in India have really targeted women, especially with their misogynism there. Uh, uh, and because of the anonymity that trolling uh, provides, they have made it a very unsafe space. So a lot of women journalists who have received um, th uh, death threats and rape threats on social media have uh, eventually chosen um, to uh, leave social media. Um, so it has created a different environment that is totally not conducive to democratic um, action. And uh, I also wanted to say that uh, on the question of new gatekeepers, uh, Facebook uh, authorities have uh, Twitter as well. Their staff has been called to um, sort of testify in front of parliamentary committees in India uh, because of reports that have appeared in organs like the Wall Street Journal. Um, so there's a lot, you know, social media transcends these kinds of territorial boundaries. So reporting in the Wall Street Journal, let's say about Facebook executives being very cozy with the BJP have led to questions in parliament about this relationship. So it opens up the uh, landscape in very different ways. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have time perhaps for just one last question. 
Um, and um, I'm com being completely arbitrary here, so I apologize to, to the, the 27 people who have lined up in the queue. Um, but, but there is this question that has come up from an anonymous uh, uh, participant who asked, who should be the arbiter of determining extremism and unde undeni undesirable uh, politics? Is it as simply, simple as saying uh, the people should be able to vote and make their decision, or is it something more complex that, um, that we should be looking for? Daniel? Um, well, it depends on what national context in which you're operating. I mean, so, you know, in the United States, it's entirely up to the voters and, and, to, and to leaders of parties and in prim party primaries. And there's essentially no regulation of this, which might be the right answer. And that's what we have in the U.S. Um, the, you know, in, in the German constitution, there are several articles in the German constitution which explicitly prohibit speech and or, or allow for the, the limits on banning of ultimately of political parties that explicitly endorse violence and assaults on the constitutional order. So the kinds of things that uh, we've heard in recent weeks in the American political debate, you know, kind of egging on militias and so on would launch an, I mean, it doesn't happen automatically. The banning of party rarely actually happens in Germany, but what happens is this, this allows for the opening of investigation and there's a kind of judicial process that is, is investigated in, with, under the interior ministry. Judges ultimately decide this. This is probably something that would never fly in the United States, but I guess, I mean, the question is, which is the, which is the best model? I would argue it probably depends on the national context. If within the German national context, I think this makes sense given their past. I hope in the United States we don't end up in that situation. But on the other hand, you do think that you know assaults, uh, verbal and rhetorical assaults on the constitutional order are, should be something that you know at least voters ought to be paying attention to. Thanks, uh, Susan. I'm going to give you the last word on this because um, it's, it's it's something that Daniel said that sort of stimulated uh, a case, uh, an example in the U.S. in the U.S. case, which is. The example of armed militias um, um, marching up and down uh, the hallways of state capitals and so forth. The understanding, and you're the constitutional law expert, but my understanding was that they that armed militias that aren't under the control of of state authorities are illegal in the United States. Not quite constitutional prohibition of the kind that Daniel talked about in the German case, but. Um, why has that not been prosecuted? Why has that not been stopped? Or is that interpretation wrong? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the specific case that you're mentioning, but generally in the United States, um, I, I can't imagine a, a law that would pass constitutional scrutiny that in fact banned any kind of speech act for being too extreme. Um, we have the First Amendment, it's, uh, it's very robustly applied. It's, um, it's robustly applied in particular to uh, political speech, to domestic political speech. And so um, we don't really operate in a, in a legal environment in which um, uh, we can regulate what people say. And then we we've uh, really rejected that model kind of wholesale. Um, and instead we focus on acts and obviously things like, uh, you know, voter intimidation at polls, right? There, there are sort of specific things uh, um, uh, and specific designations uh, of groups, although sort of those are tend to be foreign groups. Um, but it, it, it's uh, it's a it's a, a problem that uh, is not easy to remedy within the, the sort of the U.S. constitutional structure, um, because essentially we 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 neither want um, nor permit the federal government to, to regulate speech, um, including political speech. Well, terrific. Um, thank you, and thanks to all the panelists and to all the participants in today's forum. Uh, there's been a lot of illumination. I've learned a lot and I hope everyone else has as well. And I wanna uh, also express my gratitude to, uh, to Laura Kerwin and, and to Michelle English, to, to John Tierman, all of whom have helped uh, put this event together. And, and some of you have, have uh, texted me and asked about what other kinds of events we have. I, I encourage all of you uh, to visit our website and you'll see what other star forums are up uh, are, are coming up. But first, uh, I guess we can't do this, but I would say, please join me in thanking the speakers. But I guess we can if you simply, uh, you know, you put the the, uh, the, clap, the hands clapping or, or the thumbs up. I, we can't even do that on this particular version of the webinar. Anyway, the virtual thumbs are up, the virtual hands are clapping, and my gratitude is unbounded. Thank you all very much. Thank you.